gold and silver contents received back by the miners is clear profit. The copper antimony and other things in the ore being sufficient to pay all the expenses incurred. Everybody's head was full of such calculations as those, such raving insanity rather. Few people took work into their calculations, or outlay of money either, except in the work and expenditures of other people. We never touched our tunnel or our shaft again. Why? Because we judged that we had learned the real secret of success in silver mining which was not to mine the silver ourselves by the sweat of our brows and the labor of our hands, but to sell the ledges to the dull slaves of toil and let them do the mining. Before leaving Carson, the secretary and I had purchased feet from various Esmeralda stragglers. We had expected immediate returns of bullion, but were only afflicted with regular and cons constant assessments instead demands for money wherewith to develop said, said mines. These assessments had grown so oppressive that it seemed necessary to look into the matter personally. Therefore, I projected a pilgrimage to Carson and thence to Esmeralda. I bought a horse and started, in company with Mr. Ballou and a gentleman named Allendorf, a Prussian, not the party who has inflicted so much suffering on the world with his wretched foreign grammars, with their interminable repetitions of questions, which never have occurred and are never likely to occur, in any conversation among human beings. We rode through a snowstorm for two or three days and arrived at Honey Lake Smith's, a sort of isolated inn on the Carson River. It was a two-story log house situated on a small knoll in the midst of the vast basin or desert through which the sickly Carson winds its melancholy way. Close to the house were the overland stage stables built of sun-dried bricks. There was not another building within several leagues of the place. Toward sunset, about twenty hay wagons arrived and camped around the house, and all the teamsters came in to supper. A very, very rough set. There were one or two overland stage drivers there also, and half a dozen vagabonds and stragglers. Consequently, the house was well crowded. We walked out after supper and visited a small Indian camp in the vicinity. The Indians were in a great hurry about something and were packing up and getting away as fast as they could. In their broken English, they said, Buy me, buy hip water, and by the help of signs made us understand that in their opinion a flood was coming. The weather was perfectly clear and this was not the rainy season. There was about a foot of water in the insignificant river or maybe two feet. The stream was not wider than a back alley in a village, and its banks were scarcely higher than a man's head. So where was the flood to come from? We canvassed the subject a while and then concluded it was a ruse, and the Indians had some better reason for leaving in a hurry than fears of a flood in such an exceedingly dry time. Seven in the evening we went to bed in the second story, with our clothes on as usual, and all three in the same bed. For every available space on the floors, chairs, etc. was in request. And even then there was barely room for the housing of the inn's guests. An hour later we were awakened by a great turmoil. And springing out of bed we picked our way nimbly among the ranks of snoring teamsters on the floor and got to the front windows of the long room. A glance revealed a strange spectacle under the moonlight. A crooked Carson was full to the brim, and its waters were raging and foaming in the wildest way, sweeping around the sharp bends at a furious speed, and bearing on their surface a chaos of logs, brush, and all sorts of rubbish. A depression where its bed had once been in other times was already filling and in one or two places the water was beginning to wash over the main bank. Men were flying hither and thither, bringing cattle and wagons close up to the house, for the spot of high ground on which it stood extended only some thirty feet in front and about a hundred in the rear. Close to the old river bed just spoken of stood a little log stable, and in this our horses were lodged. 
While we looked, the waters increased so fast in this place that in a few minutes a torrent was roaring by the little stable and its mar margin encroaching steadily on the logs. We suddenly realized that this flood was not a mere holiday spectacle, but meant damage, and not only to the small log stable, but to the overland buildings close to the main river, for the waves had now come ashore and were creeping about the foundations and invading the great hay corral adjoining. We ran down and joined the crowd of excited men and frightened animals. We waded knee-deep into the log stable and fastened the horses and waded out almost wasty. So fast the waters increased. Then the crowd rushed in a body to the hay corral and began to tumble down the huge sacks, stacks of baled hay and roll the bales up on the high ground by the house. Meantime, it was discovered that Owens, an overland driver was missing, and a man ran to the large stable, and wading in boot-top deep, discovered him asleep in his bed, awoke him, and waded out again. But Owens was drowsy and resumed his nap, but only for a minute or two, for presently he turned in his bed, his hand dropped over the side and came in contact with the cold water. It was up level with the mattress. He waded out, breast deep, almost, and in the next moment the sunburned bricks melted down like sugar, and the big building crumbled to a ruin and was washed away in a twinkling. At eleven o'clock, only the roof of the little log stable was out of water, and our inn was on an island in mid-ocean. As far as the eye could reach in the moonlight, there was no desert visible, but only a level waste of shining water. The Indians were true prophets, but how did they get their information? I am not able to answer the question. We remained cooped up eight days and nights with the, that curious crew. Swearing, drinking, and card playing were the order of the day, and occasionally a fight was thrown in for, for variety. Dirt and vermin, but let us forget those features. Their profusion is simply inconceivable. It is better that they remain so. There were two men. However, this chapter is long enough. Chapter 31. The Guests at Honey Lake Smith's. Bully Old Arkansas. Our Landlord. Determined to fight. The Landlord's Wife. The Bully Conquered by Her. Another Start. Crossing the Carson. A narrow escape. Following our own track. A new guide. Lost in the snow. There were two men in the company who caused me particular discomfort. One was a little Swede, about twenty-five years old, who knew only one song, and he was forever singing it. By day we were all crowded into one small stifling bar room and so there was no escaping this person's music. Through all the profanity, whiskey-guzzling, old sledge and quarreling, his monotonous song meandered with never a variation in its tiresome sameness, and it seemed to me, at last, that I would be content to die in order to be rid of the torture. The other man was a stalwart ruffian called Arkansas, who carried two revolvers in his belt and a bowie knife projecting from his boot and who was always drunk and always suffering for a fight. But he was so feared that nobody would accommodate him. He would try all manner of little wary ruses to entrap somebody in, into an offensive remark, and his face would light up now and then when he fancied he was fairly on the scent of a fight, but invariably his victim would elude his toils, and then he would show a disappointment that was almost pathetic. The landlord, Johnson, was a meek, well-meaning fellow, and Arkansas fastened on him early as a promising subject, and gave him no rest day or night for a while. On the fourth morning, Arkansas got drunk and sat himself down to wait for an opportunity. Presently, Johnson came in, just comfortably sociable with whiskey, and said, I reckon the Pennsylvania election... Arkansas raised his finger impressively, and Johnson stopped. Arkansas rose unsteadily and confronted him, said he. What do you know about Pennsylvania? Answer me that. What do you know about Pennsylvania? I was only going to say 
you was only going to say you was you was only going to say what was you going to say that's it that's what I want to know I want to know what you what you know about Pennsylvania since you're making yourself so damned free answer me that Mr. Arkansas if you'd only let me who's a hindering you don't you insinuate nothing again me don't you do it don't you come in here bullying around and cussing and going on like a lunatic don't you do it because I won't stand it it fights what you want out with it I'm your man out with it said Johnson backing into a corner Arkansas following mar menacingly why I never said nothing mister Arkansas you don't give a man no chance I was only going to say that Pennsylvania was going to have an election next week that was all that was everything I was going to say I wish I may never stir if it wasn't well then why didn't you say it why'd you come swelling around that way for and trying to raise trouble well, I didn't come swelling around mister Arkansas I just I'm a liar am I great Caesar's ghost